Okay, so have you ever read a biology textbook and felt like, come on, are they leaving something out? Like what? <laughs> like they explain all the parts of a cell, but not how it actually, I don't know, works. Like it's all just parts, but not the whole picture. You know? Yeah, I think I get you. Like they're missing a level of explanation, right? Right. And it's not like this is just some random thought I had. Mm -hmm. We're actually diving into the work of a scientist who felt this way, like big time Nobel Prize winner, Albert St. Georgi. Oh, wow. St. Georgi. He was brilliant, did so much work with vitamin C, but he also had this whole other side where he talked about something called bioelectronics. Bioelectronics. Okay. So is that like, I don't know, tiny little wires inside ourselves? What are we talking about here? <laughs> Not wires exactly, but he was convinced that traditional biochemistry was missing a huge part of the story. He thought we were so focused on the molecules themselves that we were overlooking the role of energy and electrons. Energy, electrons. Okay. Uh -huh. I kind of remember those from high school science, but how do they fit into like cells and biology? Think of it this way. Imagine a symphony orchestra. Okay. You've got all these different instruments, right? But just knowing the name of each instrument doesn't tell you how the music happens. Right. You need the musicians, the conductor, the whole mm. vibe, I guess. Exactly. Sent Yorgi argued that molecules are like the instruments. They're important, but it's the flow of energy, particularly those tiny electrons, that's actually conducting the show, creating the music of life. Okay, I can kind of see that, but hold on a second. How do electrons actually move around in the cell? I thought they were stuck inside atoms. That's where this idea of charge transfer comes in. Charge transfer, hit me with it. Imagine molecules playing a quick game of catch with an electron, just passing it back and forth. Okay. That's essentially what St. Gergi was getting at. He said this creates a subtle communication network within the cell, allowing them to in a way, talk to each other. So this isn't just some abstract theory. He actually found real-world examples of this electron game in action. Oh, absolutely. And it's cooler than you might think. <laughs> Never cut open a potato and watched it turn brown. Who hasn't? It's like a law of nature or something. Well, St. Gergi show that's not just random oxidation. It's a defense mechanism. And guess what? It's linked to electron transfer. Wait, seriously. My browning potatoes are demonstrating advanced bioelectronics. In a way, yes. When you damage a potato, it triggers an enzyme that releases this molecule called a quinone. A quinone, okay, and it's a, what exactly? Quinones are kind of like electron magnets. They love to grab onto electrons from anything trying to cause further damage. So this electron grabbing isn't just about browning, it's the potato's way of like sealing the wound, fighting off invaders. That's way cooler than I ever realized. Precisely. And St. Yurgi didn't stop there. He actually proposed that imbalances in these electron donors and acceptors could be a factor in things like cancer. Okay, now my mind is officially blown. So we've got these tiny electrons potentially holding the key to huge medical mysteries. That's what he thought. He even found this substance, methyl glyoxyl, which seemed to act like a break on cell division. He theorized that cancer cells might have lost their ability to use this break effectively. So in a healthy cell, this methyl glyoxyl keeps things running smoothly, but cancer cells are like, break, what break? And just keep dividing. That's a great way to put it. And it gets even more interesting when we start looking at how these electrons actually move within the cell. Because Sent Yurgi didn't just talk about what was happening, he dug deeper into how on this really fundamental level. Okay, now you're making me nervous. Like, I only passed high school biology because they like my presentations. How many ways are we talking about here? Well, he focused on three main ways these electrons get around. Three ways. All right, lay it on. <laughs> What's the first? First, there's what we've already touched on, that idea of charge transfer between molecules, like that electron game of catch. But he also thought electrons could move within molecules, especially those big, complex ones that are crucial for life. He called this the energy band theory. Energy bands? Yeah. Okay, that sounds less like biology and more like... I need to go back to school for physics. Am I going to understand this? I think so. Imagine a large molecule, like a protein, for example. Okay, lots of proteins in our bodies. Right, and they have these repeating units, each with its own energy levels that electrons can occupy. When these units get close enough and are electronically coupled... They throw a little electron party and everyone's invited. You could say that. Their individual energy levels kind of merge forming these broader bands where electrons can exist. It's like merging lanes on a highway allows electrons to move more freely. So we've gone from molecules tossing electrons around to electrons cruising down the cellular highway. What's the third way? The third mechanism he proposed is called conjugation. Conjugation. 
Sounds complicated. It's not as bad as it sounds. Think back to organic chemistry. Remember those alternating single and double bonds between carbon atoms in a molecule? Vaguely. Uh, it's been a while. But how does that help electrons move around? It's not like they're like hitching a ride on the double bonds, are they? Not exactly hitching a ride, but you're on the right track. So in a conjugated system, the electrons in those double bonds, they become delocalized. That means they're not stuck between just two atoms anymore. So instead of being confined, they're free to roam around that whole conjugated system. Exactly. And this delocalization, it's actually crucial for a ton of biological processes. Think about beta carotene. The pigment that gives carrots their orange color, it relies on conjugated systems to absorb light energy. Wow. So all that vibrant color in nature is actually showing us this hidden world of electron activity. That's way cooler than any art class I ever took. It is fascinating, and while each of these mechanisms has its limitations on its own, Sanjurgi didn't think nature was bound by those restrictions. So he wasn't saying it's either charge transfer or energy bands or conjugation. He thought they could all be working together at the same time. Exactly. He imagined a harmonious interplay between all three of them, orchestrating this intricate, elegant dance of electrons within the cell. Okay, my mind is officially blown. We've got electron catch, electron highways, and electron timeshares, all potentially working together to make life happen. This is a lot to process. It is a lot, but this is where it gets really interesting. We're not just talking about theoretical concepts here. Sent Yergi's work has real implications for how we understand how cells function and how they might be manipulated for things like therapeutic purposes. Okay, before we jump too far ahead, I need a little more time with these mind-blowing electron concepts. So how did he actually see this electron activity? Was it like watching a microscopic light show? Not a light show exactly, but he was incredibly clever in designing experiments to make this invisible world visible. One of the ways he did this was using a special substance that changes color when it accepts an electron, kind of like a molecular chameleon. A color-changing molecule. Okay, now you're speaking my language. Yeah. Tell me more about this chameleon molecule, how to work. He used a substance called methylphenazonium, which is often shortened to PMS. Wait, PMS? Oh. Like, yes, exactly. Okay, but in this case, we're not talking about mood swings. We're talking about... Revealing the secret life of electrons. All right, I am so here for this. Tell me everything about how PMS helps us understand bioelectronics. Okay, PMS, not as we know it, but as a tool to see electron action. Yeah. I'm into it. So how did Sent Yurji actually use this color-changing molecule? He'd take a biological sample, like a bit of tissue, and mix it with the PMS. Okay, that if the PMS changed color, it meant that electrons were being donated by molecules in the sample. It was a really clever way to visualize this invisible process. So it's like a detective's luminescent spray, but instead of blood, it reveals electron activity. So what kind of clues did he uncover with his PMS experiments? One of the things he found was that tissues are surprisingly rich in electron donors, especially those connected to proteins. Wait, proteins? I thought those were like the building blocks of cells, not electron sharers. That's what most people thought. But Sent Yurgi's research suggested that proteins might have a bit of a hidden talent. Remember those sulfhydryl groups? Sulfhydryl, sulfhydryl. Okay, remind me. They're the ones with the sulfur atom and a hydrogen, and they love to donate electrons. Right, right. Those electron rich party animals. They're all over proteins, aren't they? They are. And Sint Yergi's work suggested these SH groups within proteins could be crucial for all sorts of cellular processes, far beyond just providing structure. Okay, my mind is officially blown again. So proteins aren't just static building blocks. They're part of this dynamic electron dance floor. Precisely. And remember, Sint Yergi was always looking for the so what. It wasn't enough to just observe these electron interactions. He wanted to know how they impacted the big picture. How do these tiny interactions impact how our bodies work or how they don't work in diseases? Right. He wasn't just out to win a Nobel Prize for coolest electron tricks. He wanted to understand things like cell division, cancer, all the big stuff. Exactly. And this is where his work gets really, really interesting. Remember methylglyoxal, that electron acceptor we talked about earlier? Vaguely. It's been a lot of electron talk. Right. Well, Sen Gurgi found that this methylglyoxal, it actually acted like a break on cell division. Okay. A break. I like that analogy. How does it work? It interacts with those electron-rich SH groups we were just talking about. So if those SH groups are crucial for cell division and methylglyoxal comes in and grabs their electrons, it's like putting the brakes on the whole process. Precisely. Sen Yurgi believed this was a key part of how cells regulate their own growth. 
But like any good braking system, there has to be a release mechanism too. Otherwise, our cells would be stuck in park forever. So what lifts the methylglyoxal brake? Another molecule, an enzyme called glyoxalase. Glyoxalase, okay, and it does what? It basically swoops in and transforms methylglyoxal into a harmless substance. This allows cell division to proceed. So it's like this carefully choreographed dance, right? Yeah. Methylglyoxal puts on the brakes, glyoxalase releases them, and the cell divides at just the right pace. Except what happens when this dance goes wrong? That's where St. Georgi's cancer theory comes in. He proposed that cancer cells might actually have a faulty glyoxylase system. So the brake is stuck on, but the release mechanism is broken. That would explain why cancer cells just keep dividing uncontrollably. Exactly. It's like they've lost the ability to regulate their growth based on this delicate electron dance. And this new perspective, this bioelectronics perspective, it could have huge implications for how we think about treating cancer. Oh, okay, now we're talking. This is what I love about these deep dives. You start with this seemingly simple idea, electron transfer, and suddenly you're looking at potential breakthroughs in cancer treatment. And it goes even beyond cancer. St. Yergi thought that understanding bioelectronics could completely revolutionize how we understand tons of diseases and biological processes. For example, he was really fascinated by how organisms defend themselves from harm. And I'm guessing he found a connection to electron transfer there, too. Oh, absolutely. Remember that browning apple from before? Yeah, my favorite example of advanced bioelectronics. Well, he saw that as a prime example of electron transfer at work, playing a critical role in the plant's defense system. Okay, hold on. So my afternoon snack is secretly a fortress of bioelectronic warfare. Tell me more. When you cut an apple, you're damaging its cells, right? It's a massacre in there. It is. And that damage triggers a chain reaction. It releases an enzyme that reacts with those antioxidant polyphenols we were talking about before. Okay. The ones that are supposed to be good for us. Exactly. But when the apple is damaged, those polyphenols get transformed into, you guessed it, quinones. Those electron-grabbing ninjas we talked about before. So the browning of an apple isn't just about oxidation. It's about those quinones going on the defensive. Exactly. They react with proteins at the site of the injury, kind of sealing off the damaged area and preventing further damage. So it's like a natural bandage, but instead of gauze, it's electron transfer doing the healing. That's yeah. way cooler than any first aid kit I've ever seen. It really is. And it just goes to show how this seemingly simple concept of electron transfer can have these huge implications for understanding all sorts of biological processes. This is absolutely mind blowing, but we've talked a lot about electron donors and acceptors, those SH groups, even PMS. What other players are there in this cellular orchestra? Well, St. Yurgi was really fascinated by the role of functional groups. Functional groups, now those ring a bell. They're basically specific groups of atoms within a molecule that give it its, you know, its personality. Right, right. Like how oxygen makes things flammable or whatever. Exactly. They determine how a molecule interacts with others. And St. Gergi was particularly interested in those containing nitrogen and oxygen because... Because they often have those lone pairs of electrons just begging to be shared. You got it. Making them great electron donors under the right circumstances. Right, like those nitrogen atoms always trying to share their extra electron. It's basically high school all over again. Yeah. So these functional groups, they're like the different sections of the orchestra each with its own sound and way of contributing to the overall music. A perfect analogy. St. Yergi truly believed that by understanding the electron donating and accepting abilities of these functional groups, we could unlock a deeper understanding of how cells function. Okay, I'm starting to feel like I'm actually hearing the music of the cells now. That's what St. Yergi wanted. He argued that we can't just think about molecules like they're static pieces on a chessboard. We have to consider these tiny electron interactions, the subtle shifts in energy that influence how those pieces move. He's basically saying that to understand the game of life, you need to feel the electricity running beneath it. This is heavy stuff. But I have feeling really, he didn't just leave it at that. Do you have any thoughts on how we could use this knowledge, especially when it comes to things like cancer? He did. And it's some of his most fascinating and potentially groundbreaking work, but we'll have to save that for next time. Okay, you've officially left me hanging on a cliff. I can't wait to dive into that. <laughs> okay, so last time we were talking about how even a simple apple is like this fortress of bioelectronic warfare. It's kind of amazing. It really is. And it's all thanks to this concept of electron transfer. Right. Which St. Yergi believed could be the key to understanding everything from how cells communicate to 
how we might be able to treat diseases like cancer. Exactly. And this is where his work gets really exciting because it's not just about understanding how life works. It's about what happens when things go wrong. Right. And we were about to dive into that when we left off last time. Like, what did he think about how we could actually use this knowledge, especially for something as complex as cancer? Well, remember those color changing experiments with PMS? Oh, yeah. The electron detective spray. Exactly. Those weren't just for show. Sengergi used those experiments to show that methylglaxol could actually inhibit the growth of cells. Wait, seriously? Like, they could actually see this potential cancer treatment in action? Exactly. And it wasn't just in a petri dish. He even did experiments on mice with tumors, and the yeah. results were really promising. Okay, so tell me more about these mice experiments. What did he do? He injected methylglaxol directly into the tumors. Mm. It actually worked. He was able to slow the growth of the tumors and, in some cases, even cure the mice. Wow. So this electron-grabbing molecule wasn't just a theory. It was showing real potential as a cancer treatment. That's incredible. It was a huge discovery, and it really got people thinking, what if we could actually manipulate this electron balance in cells to fight disease? Oh, right. What if we could use electron acceptors like methylglaxol to target those out-of-control cancer cells? Yeah. It's like a whole new way of thinking about medicine. Uh, Instead of just trying to kill the cancer cells with chemo, what if we could rewire their circuitry, you know? That's the idea. And while Sent Yorgi's work with methylglaxol was a huge breakthrough, he knew there were still challenges. For example, getting those electron acceptors to the right place in the body, especially in solid tumors, that's still a huge hurdle. That's right. Like, it's one thing to inject something into a single tumor, but how do you target trillions of rogue cells all over the body? That's oh. a lot of electrons. It's a huge challenge, and it's something that researchers are still working on today. But Sent Yorgi's work really opened up this whole new avenue of exploration. He gave us the map. Now we just have to figure out the best route. I love that analogy he gave us the map. It's like he shined this light on this hidden world of bioelectronics, and now we're just beginning to understand its potential. Exactly. He challenged us to see life as this dynamic dance of energy and information flow. And I think as we keep exploring this dance, who knows what incredible breakthroughs are waiting for us. I think that's a great place to leave it. This whole deep dive has been absolutely mind-blowing. We went from these tiny electron-swapping molecules to potential cancer therapies. And it all started with a scientist who wasn't afraid to ask different questions. You know, He looked at the same things everyone else was looking at, but in a completely different way. Exactly. And that's what made his work so important. Sent Yorgi's legacy is a powerful reminder that sometimes the most groundbreaking discoveries, they come from seeing the world in a new light. Absolutely. It's about asking those what if questions, even if they sound a little crazy at first. So to wrap things up for our listeners today, what's the one thing you really want them to take away from our deep dive into bioelectronics? I want them to remember that life at its core is electric. Every breath we take, every thought we have, it's all driven by these intricate electron interactions. And the more we learn about this hidden world, the more we understand about ourselves and our place in this universe. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey into the world of bioelectronics. Until next time, keep those electrons flowing.